Good morning. It's really, truly an honor to be here with Rahel Dink, and I really want to thank you all for the invitation and for the honor to be opening this conference. Um, I think what's so exciting for us as visitors from abroad to be experiencing here with you today is a discussion that's really on the cusp of the opening of this new institution of memory, 23 and a half Frontink Memorial Site. Um, the moment when this really transformative and creative and thoughtful and forward-looking memorial institution is being opened when mourning is still so fresh, when the events that led to this are still so recent in everybody's mind and in um, the words that we heard from Rahel Dink this morning. And yet, when memory is already has to be transferred to people who weren't here to experience it. And so I think that this is what you've all been thinking about. How do we best do that? So from my own perspective and from the perspective of my own work, um, I've been thinking about whether we can remember other people's memories. Can we remember other people's memories? I believe that we can and that we do. But saying so, I must also ask how? By what means and through what media, through what kinds of institutions do past life worlds come down to us? What factors shape and frame acts of historical transmission across generations? How do political changes, how do migration and diaspora, how does the passage of time itself influence this process? In my work, I've argued that descendants of individuals and of communities that have survived powerful collective experiences, punctual catastrophes such as war, or genocide, or extreme violence, longer repressive political regimes such as autocratic dictatorships, but also, I would say, transformative political movements such as coups, revolutions, and uprisings. How do um, descendants of these um, events often feel as though they were shaped by events that preceded their birth. They feel as though they can remember these events even though they were not there to live them. Yet, um, when they experience these events, they don't experience them as memory, but as what I've been thinking about as post-memory. They're belated, they're temporally and qualitatively removed, they're inflected by later individual and collective events. In my experience, in my understanding, the family is not the exclusive site of this powerful form of transmission. I see post-memory as a generational structure of memory transfer embedded in multiple forms of mediation. And one of the examples that I've used to understand this comes from Art Spiegelman's graphic memoir, Mouse, and this is his first drawing of his understanding of his father's experience in the Holocaust in Auschwitz, where he draws um, a well-known public photograph by Margaret Burke White, uh, which you see on the top, which is a photograph of the survivors of Buchenwald, not Auschwitz at all, but Spiegelman um, draws this um, and he puts a little arrow on one of the figures and he says, Papa. So he, what he does is see his father as um, through the eyes of a public photograph that's become very public and that then becomes the image that he uses again and again. And I don't know if you can see the, the multiple slide of this first drawing of Mouse, which was from 1973, where you see the father and son mice, who are Jew, his representation of Jews, sitting together, and the father is actually explaining, telling the story to his child, but when that child grows up, he understands that story through the public image much better than through the private transmission. So this is to say that the family is there as a factor, but it, the post-memory is not exclusively familial. 
Um, and I think that wh what I see is a generational structure of memory transferred that's embedded in mediation because even in its most intimate moments, family life is imbricated in a collective imaginary that's shaped by a shared archive of stories and images such as this famous photograph, for example, by public ideologies and beliefs, by myths, fantasies, and projections. All of these influence the transfer of individual and familial remembrance. Oops. Nope. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, sorry. The, the media scholar Alison Landsberg has gone so far as to argue that public media such as films, television shows, images and stories become prosthetic memories, merging with our own individual mnemonic landscapes the way, in a way that prostheses become part of our own bodies. But I would argue that public memory and publicly available archives, documents, images and stories most often determined by dominant ideologies and hegemonic beliefs, can and also often do conflict with individual and familial remembrance. Such contradictions are typical of the complex negotiations that, in my view, define post-memory. Beyond the family, a more affiliative post-memory can encompass a larger generational collective in an organic web of transmission one that actually mirrors familial structures of transmission. So whether familial or affiliative, however, the embodied acts of transfer that characterize post-memory are limited in time. The scholars of memory, Jan and Alaida Asman, have argued that what they call communicative memory reaches across no more than three generations, traveling from parents to children, from grandparents to grandchildren. But those are the three generations, it's limited that way. And after that, they argue we have to rely on institutionalized memory in archives, in museums, in memorials, in school curricula, and in public and private rituals and observances of, public, of past events. And the Asmans term this institutionalized kind of memory, cultural memory. And you can see that they're very good at conceptualizing this kind of thing into a grid. Distance and institutionalization threaten to weaken the force of the past presence as memory, and they turn it into history or myth. The Asmans thus distinguish between what they call a solid distant horizon in which the past is monumentalized to consolidate society by means of founding myths on the one hand, so the solid distant horizon in which memory is institutionalized and monumentalized, and what they call a near horizon of emergent memories that are fluctuating, that are mobile, that are contingent, and thus feel closer to the effects of embodied transfer, of embodied post-memory. So when these emergent memories diverge from an agreed upon master narrative about the past, they become counter memories that seek to challenge and subvert hegemonic memory cultures. The term counter memory, contre mémoire, comes from Michel Foucault's 1971 essay, Nietzsche Genealogy History, and his discussion of Nietzsche's history, which is monumental, and genealogy, which is more intimate and more contingent. So, I would like to talk today about this relationship about memory and counter-memory. Um, and I invoke counter-memory here in one of several meanings of the term. And I think of it as memories that emerge in particular subcultures, often in response to historical injustices resulting in historical wounds. So this discrepancy between hegemonic memory and the multiple counter-memories explain why official memory is often and always the subject of contest and critique. But the monumentality of hegemonic memory also explains why it is so difficult to challenge and to dislodge. If you, a really um, wonderful recent essay by a former student of mine, Yarula Wegner, his essay on counter-memory that has to do with music cultures actually, is very clear in uh, defining how this term has been used and misused, and I hope he wouldn't think I'm misusing it now, but I'm grateful to him for a very clear conceptualization of it. 
In recent years, memorial institutions such as museums, archives, um, and memorials have understood that monumental history, which represents the solid distant horizon of national pasts, needs to be counterbalanced by more intimate displays that animate or reanimate the past so as to give visitors, um, um, so as to, um, to give visitors a sense of experiencing it emotionally and viscerally. They need to transform this solid distant horizon into a feeling of the fluctuating near horizons in which memory is, or at least seems to be, open to counter memory. The memory scholar Andreas Hussen recently reminded us that whereas in the 19th century museums were compared to mausoleums that buried the past, they must now be taken seriously as institutions that strive to provide some personal connection to an investment in the past. So I want to venture today that to animate the past in this way, these memory institutions often take their cues from the experience of familial and affiliative post-memory by inviting visitors to inhabit the position, not so much of past historical actors, but of close relatives or descendants. They're cast not so much as witnesses, but as what I would think of as co-witnesses, listening to testimonies in the museum, connecting to objects, participating through media, not as though they were the participants themselves, but as though they were accompanying the participants on this journey. But the strategies of post-memory to provoke affect and emotion that bind us to the past are not necessarily counter progressively counter-memorial. They're counter-memorial, but not necessarily progressive, as we can see in this image of the um, uprising in, in Charlottesville, right, extreme right-wing uh, white nationalist um, march in Charlottesville. Um, they can serve hegemonic purposes as well as counter-memorial ones. The structure and conception of experiential museums and memorials, their negotiation between memory and counter-memories, thus draws on the complex psychology of post-memory that modulates between identification and disidentification, curiosity and indifference, knowledge and ignorance, between blame, shame, protection and repair, between desire, projection, and appropriation that define the present investment in the past in so many parts of the world. These messy feelings defining post-memory can gesture to the risks and to the possibilities it offers when we use it as a template or model for the public transmission of memory. But as the title um, and topic of our conference indicate, Historical and memorial institutions look not only to the past, but they look to the future. Think about our title, Paths Towards Another Future. Um, when, we, when I was first invited to the conference, it was called something else. It was called Dealing with Difficult Pasts. So the renaming, I think, is really significant, and we really need to think about it. Um, so these institutions structure our present view of the past, but of course they also structure a future that will look back at our own present, um, and a, a present that's modeled by the vision we have of the past, molded by the vision we have of the past. Um, that self-image is necessarily based on contest and disagreement, and those disagreements often center around the design and organization of new memory institutions. Invariably, as soon as they are even conceived, we, start, we argue about them. We argue about them from the moment of their opening. We keep doing so as time passes. These controversies, I think, can provide a measure of where a group or nation currently stands, but also of how much controversy and disagreement, how much counter-memory, in fact, it can accommodate. At the present moment, we seem, I think, across the globe to be in an era of memory that both supports nationalist and ethnocentric imaginaries of a monumental past and vigorously challenges these with new monumental memory structures dedicated to national catastrophes or to injured minority populations across the globe. And here are just a few recent quite monumental 
um, institutions that have opened in the last few years that I wanted to show you, though not, I'm not able to discuss. But of course, we will be discussing with all of you who are working at some of these institutions how they think about these questions. I've worried that, this is what I've worried about, that even while they celebrate moments of patri patriotism on the one hand, or use the occasion of these institutions' foundings as occasions of national reckoning, that these memory institutions risk strengthening rather than contesting ethnic and national barriers that are responsible for the violent histories that are commemorating. This is the risk I'm worried about. That they risk, but I'm also worried that they risk doing so precisely by appropriating the effective structures of post-memory in their conceptions and in their conception and then in the experiences that they offer their visitors. How, I think we must ask, can they avoid confirming hegemonic versions of the past and enhancing national myths? The, um, the academic structure, uh, study of memory, what we've become, now has become a kind of field memory studies in the last 25 years or so, um, has, I think, been mobilized by counter-memory rather than memory to challenge nationalism, ethnocentrism, and identity politics in the interests of a more inclusive and connected future. It's conceived of memory as transnational and transcultural, showing that cultures and nations themselves are not static or clearly circumscribed, but in constant active contact with one another. And you see here um, the Recoleta Cultural Center in Buenos Aires, which is referring uh, together in a mirror image to the torture sites um, in uh, Argentina mirroring the uh, death camps in uh, Germany and Poland in the Holocaust, making these connections and then getting out of the strictly national and nationalist frame. As a field that was developed in the 1990s, memory studies was inspired by critical public memory practices by counter monuments and public acts of counter memory, not just in Europe, as we see in these two slides um, from Germany, but also in um, South Africa and in South America and many other parts of the world. I would say that in, in the present moment, such counter memory practices persist, and we will hear from Andrea Knitz um, very soon. Uh, but largely, I believe that we are in an era of monumental memory rather than counter-memory right now, as the huge institutions that I've just shown you, I think, show. So I'm hoping that over the next two days, we can discuss which current memorial and archival practices might inspire us to build on this critical counter-memorial edge that's represented by these counter-monuments. How we can think about different violent histories in relation to each other, rather than separately and competitively as the exclusive property of a single identity-based group. And how we might mobilize the archives not only of violence and catastrophe, but also of resistance, of protest, of hope for the future. How we can move forward toward a future that recalls and acknowledges past crimes without succumbing to nationalist or ethnocentric ideologies that perpetuate a culture of fear and denial how we could reclaim memories of hope and change rather than only memories of violence and catastrophe. So we're about to study over the next two days a number of memorial museums across the globe in some detail. And we're about to hear from many of you who have been working on and with them. So what I'd like to do to illustrate some of my points is not to talk about a museum such as the institutions that you're all working on, but to talk, to examine a smaller and more recent counter memory project um, that consists in a more punctual intervention rather than a monumental structure. I want to think about the performance of memory and how it itself can use the effective strategies of post memory in order to shape the past and the future, and how in fa effective or inhibiting this use of the structures of post-memory might be. So I want to talk about this project, Thinking of You, a project by a Kosovo-born artist 
and uh, residing in London in collaboration with a New York-based political theorist and Kosovo specialist. Um, on a small and fleeting scale, this activist participatory project offers a counter memory to Kosovar history, and it aims to erase silence, to contest denial, to enable visibility. It, bring, it aims to bring recognition to long, a long-standing history of ethnic warfare in, in, in part carried out on the bodies of women. Specifically, it calls attention to the estimated 20,000 Albanian women, 6% of the female population, who were systematically incarcerated, humiliated, and raped, often in front of their families by Serb paramilitary during the Albanian separatist war against the Milosevic regime. So this is also a very recent event, moving from memory to post-memory in a counter-memorial vein. So the artist said, I started to question the silence, how we could not hear their voices during and after the war, and thought about how to portray the women in contemporary art. Attempting to compensate for the legal impunity of the perpetrators, the absence until quite recently of rape as a crime of war from the ICC, and the post-war silence of the victims themselves, the artist found a medium that would involve a broad-based participation across the country. She traveled through Kosovo to collect 5,000 dresses and skirts donated by survivors and by other women. With the help of dozens of volunteers, she then hung these on clotheslines in the Pristina football stadium on the anniversaries of Pristina's liberation of, by NATO forces after a three months bombing campaign by the Serbs. In an interview in London, the artist explained her choice of medium. She said, air dirty laundry in public is a way of saying, talk about your private issues in public, but in this case, the laundry is washed, it's clean, like the women survivors who are clean, pure, they carry no stain. So they, she installed 45 clotheslines with colorful dresses and skirts across a football stadium, a symbol of masculine competition and sociality. These are striking, beautiful objects that powerfully resignified the space, and yet, the anniversary event itself was only a small part of this durational artwork. The donation and collection of dresses throughout the summer, the moments of embodied exchange of clothing and stories, the networks that were created, all worked to combat silence even more effectively than the um, installation itself. Bringing communities of women together to exchange the gift of a dress or skirt, to speak openly about their or their relatives' abuse, to hug and offer one another support and remembrance is a large-scale act of repair through the medium of touch. The film that the artist created that you see some stills here to document this process shows women and men gathering in numerous public locations across the country to exchange clothes, to fold them, to care for them while listening to each other and becoming attuned to the stories of the dresses themselves as material remnants and witnesses um, of the events. Mothers and daughters are seen traveling together to donate embodying acts of familial transmission. And the artist, whom you see here, received many of the items themselves and she visibly performs the affects evoked by the donations. On screen, she cries in sympathy, she hugs, she holds the people coming forward to tell their stories. I think she's found a haptic medium through which to reverse silence and injustice to create visibility and voice and to activate an embodied connection between the past and the present. In a classic essay on trauma and gender, Roberta Culverson wrote that, quote, no experience is more one's own than harm to one's own skin, but none is more locked within that skin, played out within it in actions other, rather, other than words, in patterns of consciousness below the everyday and the construction of language. So harm to the skin, Culbertson argues, is incommunicable. It's outside language. Skin is at once a site of bodily boundary and a site of social connection, the space precisely of being alone and of being with others. Skin is the very site of touch, what Merleau-Ponty calls intercorporeality. Because skin records experience and retains memory, it can also transmit it through touch and through a haptic visuality. So you, through the use of fabric and touch, I think this project has made skin itself a medium of transmission. 
Without violating the boundedness of each survivor's trauma, it calls on others to find a point of intercorporeal effective connection. To give their uh, efforts maximum prestige, the artists invited celebrities to donate, and Kosovo's former woman president says that she participated in order to say to the survivors, you are not alone in this, we are all together. And this line is repeated throughout the film um, in which the victims come then to be referred to as martyrs who sacrifice for our country. So you see how easily this um, suffering can be heroized, uh, martyrized, and monumentalized, right? So we have this wonderful moments of exchange and then suddenly they become martyrs and they become mythics, M mythic, mythified. But there is one really powerful moment of skepticism in the film that I think is really important because I find the film too celebratory. Um, and it's a skepticism about the efficacy of this project in the vo through the voice of an elderly woman civil rights activist. She says, I'm giving this for the women and girls who were assaulted by a certain weapon, rape. Through this campaign, society has been made aware and victims have been given a, given a voice. However, the problem remains that they don't know the perpetrators. In order to identify the perpetrators, there should be political action, political and diplomatic pressure for Serbia, Serbia to uncover its police, military, and state records so that we know where the, that mili their, where the military bases were located. Thus, we could convene trials and seek social justice. What do activist um, participatory memory projects like Thinking of You accomplished as opposed to memorial museums and other official institutions? I think this is a really important question as many more projects like this have begun to proliferate. And I, I'm showing you a slide here of the Redress Project, which is um, a project by a Canadian Métis artist, Jamie Black, who calls attention to and memorializes the femicides of uh, numbers and numbers of indigenous women in Canada. And then also um, a, per, you know, a, a performance by Regina Galindo, a Guatemalan artist who uh, in her project Presencia wears the dresses of women who've been assaulted. I think that these performances can neither substitute for legal redress or economic reparation, nor can they compensate for the lack of it, even if it might appear as though they're doing similar work. One certainly hopes that some space, small space for legal efforts to bring perpetrators out of, out of impunity and justice can be made through these projects. But I would suggest that beyond the celebrity photos, the assertions about empathy and solidarity in Kosovo, something important was exchanged as Kosovo citizens came together in the acts of epidermal touch and connection that were staged in Thinking of You and that are being staged in other similar projects um, right now. The transmission of traumatic history occurs across class, gender, generation, across space and time in these projects. As dresses here were moved from the closet to the football stadium, trauma was dislodged from the confines of individual bodies and families. And painful, a painful past was brought into the present socially through gesture, touch, and affect and also through digital acts of transfer on YouTube. And with this greater acknowledgement and dissemination, something important is indeed being transformed. It seems to me that these acts of exchange do more than to acknowledge a past crime. The political theorist and photo historian Ariela Azulay has written about the effort to potentialize history, to focus not just on what happened and why, but to imagine what might have happened in a more just frame. In that spirit, and as a form of a kind of expanded reparative post-memory, could we grant the women who might have worn these dresses, or might have had them torn off in violent acts of rape, a time before the violation? Could we imagine the future that they envisioned and that was taken from them a future that those who were able to survive might have reclaimed. Could we look at, a, at time itself as more multidimensional, um, in more multidimensional ways that allow for transformation and possible repair? So I'm sending, um, in sending us back to these 
past presence and their own ideas, their own envisioning of a future, rather than backshadowing with the catastrophe that we in our own present know all too well, I think that this installation is performing an act of repair made urgent by the long neglect of local or national recognition on site. I think that imagining alternate potential history should also be part of the work of post-memory in memory institutions. It means reading history forwards as well as backwards, not only through the affects, emotions, and desires of descendants, of post-memorial descendants, but also tentatively and humbly through the eyes of the historical actors themselves and through those who will be revisiting our interpretations in the future. So I think it's here that it's helpful to do, I think, what we'll be doing in the next two days, which is to read different memory and counter-memory projects together. While some memory institutions defend one specific version of the past, others can potentialize history to see what was from many different angles um, and uh, through diff many different eyes. Such openness to different potential instead of one single linear history means the ability to accommodate conflicting truths that could lead to alternate futures and counterintuitively, perhaps, to alternate pasts as well. I think that these kinds of open-ended projects bring out potentialities of post-memory and to its contradictory open-ended desires and fears. They offer a means to mobilize the violent narratives of the past in such a way that their perpetuation and repetition no longer seem inevitable. Thank you. <laughs>